playing against the Packer franchise, I think it was the best franchise in the history of football. When Taylor was there, when Horning was there, when Starr was there, when Dollar was there, when McGee was there, Forrest Gregg, Fuzzy, Jerry Kramer. So to say that 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, I don't know. I really have no clue. Today, we're counting down the top 10 greatest Packers players of all time. You're talking so many great Packers that I'm not sure a number really defines it. The Green Bay Packers, the finest football team in the world. We got to pick 10. We could take a hopper and make like 60 to try and force our way into 10. What are we doing? Don't try this at home. And they've had three real distinct periods of true greatness. The Lambeau years. The Green Bay Packers are the world champions. The Lombardi years. NFL champions for the third great year. And then the Favre, Holmgren, Reggie White years. It means more to us. With 90 seasons in the NFL and 21 Hall of Famers, it's no easy task sorting through these resumes. I mean, that's a lot to choose from. Come on! I don't know, man. These guys were all good guys. I mean, you're going to say one's better than the other. In our business, there is no second place. Either your first or your last. The Packers history is so rich and diverse, there shouldn't be one criteria where you say you have to be a Hall of Famer or you have to win a championship. Was this person ever the best at what he did? As the only publicly owned franchise, being a Packer comes with a unique responsibility. There has to be a certain amount of class and dignity that goes into being an all-time great Packer. We're set a very high standard. In Green Bay, there is really this belief that they're all in it together. We got the Green Bay Packers here! The Packers are a reminder of what sports used to be and maybe should be. There wouldn't be any professional football without the Packers and their tradition. You only know Green Bay because of the Packers. And the number 10 Green Bay Packer of all time. You know, I think that whoever did this rating is in the media, right? So, therefore, you understand that they never played the game. So they don't understand who Jim Taylor was or how he played the game. What the hell's going on out here? Number 10, Jim Taylor, is a travesty. He's one of the three or four all-time greatest Packers. He was the workhorse. He was the guy carrying the load for that team. And he Kyle drives his way in for the Packer touchdown. I don't know that you can put Jim Taylor high enough just from the production standpoint and really what drove that Packer offense back then. The number one play in our offensive category is the is the power sweep. Lombardi's Packers were the power sweep offense and Jim Taylor was the guy who ran it. Jim Taylor on a power sweep. People knew what we were going to do and we defied them to stop us and we uh, it was just a matter of uh, may the better man win. When I was growing up, I was a Jimmy Taylor freak. I love that guy. For fullback Jim Taylor, number 31, each step is a battle, a demanding test for his courage, skill, and character. The physicality that Jim Taylor brought to the table is right at the forefront of what made him great. He wouldn't back down from any contact at all. The guy was a tough physical player. I'm going to make the tackle respect me. Taylor is in for the touchdown. And I'm going to punish him. I'm going to hit the tackler harder than he's going to hit me. He was one of those guys that would set the tempo. He just brought a certain toughness to the running back spot. So why is Jim Taylor only number 10 on our list? His accomplishments were overshadowed by a different Jim. If Jim Brown and Jim Taylor didn't play in the same era, we would be thinking about Jim Taylor as probably the greatest fullback from that era. From 1960 to 1964, there were only 13 1,000-yard seasons. Five of those seasons were Jim Taylor. Taylor gallops through the gap for a Green Bay score. 1962, we scored 19 touchdowns in one year. Nobody at that time had ever scored 19 touchdowns in a season. Jim Brown never even scored 19 touchdowns rushing the football. 
Our number 10 Packer was named MVP in 1962, and his 19 touchdowns remains a single-season team record. But it was his role on four championship teams that earned him a spot on our list. If you want to think of the prototypical Green Bay Packer performance, you think of Jimmy Taylor in the 62 championship game. In single-degree temperatures, Taylor battled a brutal Giants defense led by Hall of Famer Sam Huff. Taylor is taking his lumps today. This could get personal. Taylor carried the ball a career-high 31 times and scored the game's only touchdown. The Green Bay Packers are the National Football League champions. Jim Taylor is the classic Lombardi Packer. Coming up, find out which offensive lineman is the only one to make our list. They had a number of good linemen. Vince Lombardi coached 10 Hall of Fame Packers. Not every one can make our list. Willie Davis and Henry Jordan with a combined nine Pro Bowls anchored the defensive line for over 10 years. On the offensive line, Jim Ringo was the league's most dominating center of the early 1960s. Arguably, Forrest Gregg was the most talented tackle in NFL history. Forrest Gregg cleared the way. Vince Lombardi saves the finest football player ever coached. That ought to be a reason enough for him to get in the top ten. As great as these titans of the trenches were, it is a non-Hall of Fame guard who made our list. The number nine Green Bay Packer of all time, Jerry Kramer. Jerry Kramer was a terrific pulling guard. He's a smart guy. I am Jerry Kramer. I play right guard. I've been with Green Bay for the past 10 years. He was a key player on the team of that decade, which some people would say may be the greatest team of all time, the Lombardi Packers. When you think of the Packers of the 60s and you think of the Lombardi Packers, remember Lombardi at the blackboard. This is our play. We're trying to get us a seal here and a seal here and to try to run this play in the alley. Getting the seal was the guards. Our off guard pulls hard, and he finds the first opening. And Jerry Kramer was the best at that particular skill. Number 64, all-pro guard Jerry Kramer, leads Elijah Pitts around in. And what made him truly great was Kramer was a good enough athlete that he could get out there and he could make that block. He had really good feet, and he could pull, and he could get outside, and he could get in front of either Taylor or Horning and lead that play around the edge and block in space. Watch that number 64. That's Jerry Kramer. Kramer wasn't just a key component of the Packers' sweep. Our number nine Packer was more than a lineman. He was a great football player. He could run with anybody. He could block on the perimeter. And then, oh, by the way, he could kick an extra point if he needed him to. When they plugged Jerry in a couple of times, he kicked three field goals in the 1962 championship game. Jerry Kramer kicks. And the ball finds it. The score, Green Bay 16, New York 7. Kramer is the reason the most famous Packer play in history is remembered more for the block than for the score. Cue the Kramer clip. Star begins the count. Takes the snap. He's at the quarterback. Take it easy. He's the touchdown. The Packers are not in front. It's probably the most famous tackle to tackle block in the history of pro football. See how he opens up a hole with that block? It's pride that did that. He's determined that every fan that sees him will believe that they saw the best right guard in football doing his job. In so many ways, it defines the Packers, but it also defines Kramer as a guy who, in that situation, up against a great defensive tackle, makes the play that scores the touchdown that wins the championship. Love Jerry Kramer, but he wasn't even the best offensive lineman on that, those teams. They were Hall of Famers on each side of him. This was a seven-time All-Pro. When they picked the team of the NFL's first 50 years, Jerry Kramer was the guard. I think Jerry Kramer's known more for what he did after football. Jerry Kramer, the author of a book, bestseller, instant replay of a few years ago. 
it's fine. I mean, an offensive lineman that didn't make the Hall of Fame, top 10 for the Packers, eh, I'm not going to quibble. The number eight Green Bay Packer of all time, James Lofton. In 1978, Lofton burst upon the NFL with a combination of concentration and speed that gave him a season total of 46 catches for 818 yards. Great deep threat, awesome beard, bad teams. Really bad teams. Packers receivers have always defined themselves in championship games. It is going to be a touchdown to Andre Risen. Except James Lofton. Between 1978 and 1986, he never even sniffed a Super Bowl. Lofton makes our list because despite playing on just one playoff team, number 80 was the iconic receiver of his era. James Lofton was a great receiver, and he played at a time when the Packers were not necessarily winning and getting to championship games. So for a lot of people, he might be lost in translation. He was the classic, ultimate, downfield, deep threat, year in and year out. And Lofton is a 9-3 spinner. He had two seasons when he averaged over 22 yards per catch. He might be the best athlete in the entire league. One thing about James Lofton you could always count on was at least one time in a game, he'd catch a ball and you'd see his long stride and you'd see this defensive back from him behind them. He still is probably one of the fastest humans in the world right now. I mean, he's, he's going to be fast going to his grave. James Lofton has left no doubt that he is one of the finest receivers in football today. Lofton might be the most gifted athlete on our list, but he gets stuck at number eight as a victim of circumstance. You know, Lofton's a tough case because his numbers are very impressive, but I'm not sure he ever occupied people's minds nationwide. James Lofton definitely deserves to be on this list. Is he one of the ten best Packers of all time? I don't think so. I think when, when you get guys like Forrest Gregg not on the list, Jim Ringo not on the list. I believe he's a Hall of Famer. James Lofton caught 532 passes for the Packers in his career and averaged 18.2 yards per catch over his entire Packers career. I'm not sure a lot of people thought of him in the way that he should be thought of. He was a big-time elite NFL wide receiver. Eight receptions, 131 yards, and a touchdown for James Lofton. Lombardi's Packers should just be one through nine on this, and then Lofton at ten. That should be this list. Up next... What happened to me? Find out which Packer on our list also made a name for himself on a different team. I think of him as Eagle first, and then a Packer. Hey, I'm Troy Palomalu. <laughs> Our list of greatest Packers is just for the players. What are you doing out there? But if we did include coaches, there'd be plenty to choose from. That's the way, all right. Curly Lambeau established the franchise and its winning tradition, guiding them to six championships. The Green Bay Packers are the world champions. The pack was back under Mike Holmgren, who took them to two Super Bowls, winning one. Congratulations, I couldn't be more proud of this team. Vince Lombardi resurrected football in Green Bay, leading the Packers to five titles in his nine-year stint. Congratulations for the second year in a row. Six players on our countdown played under Lombardi, including the next man on our list. The number seven Green Bay Packer of all time, Herb Adams. He was simply one of the finest single cover people in the history of this league. The ultimate cover corner. Herb Adderley was that guy that other teams just avoided uh, totally. He should be even higher than where he is on this list. Beautiful save by Adderley. Quiet defensive backs, they don't get higher than seven. If Herb Adderley had been a Deion Sanders personality, another classic by Deion. Herb would be a one or two on this list. 
Curb is on his man like a wet shirt. When the pass is underthrown, he's there to intercept, and it's destination goal line. The thing about Herb Adderley is, at one point, they had no idea he was going to be a corner. He didn't come into the league as a corner. The Packers drafted Adderley as a running back, but already featured a Hall of Fame backfield. The Green Bay backfield with Horning and, and Taylor, that was really one of the best running back combinations we've seen in the league. It didn't bode well for another running back coming into the Green Bay Packer organization. After an injury in the defensive backfield, Lombardi moved Adderley to cornerback, where he intercepted 48 passes and returned seven for touchdowns in his career. He was so dangerous, you know, with the football. Uh, and I think that comes from his background in college of being a, a great running back and a, and a receiver. I could run because I was a running back, so I used to want to get my hands on the football and take off and go the other way with it. Picked off by Herb Adderley all the way. Lombardi often said after that, I mean, can you imagine if I hadn't had that injury come up and if I just kept this guy on offense his entire career, when you see how much he means to this defense. Natalie made a name for himself by stealing the spotlight on the grandest of stages. We're set for action here in the second Super Bowl game. They had been told not to throw to the right side, not to throw passes all the way at all. And in fourth quarter, he said, what the heck, I might as well take a shot. And he threw it over there, and Herb picked it and ran it back. On 70-yard interception return. It was the first defensive touchdown in Super Bowl history. Let it go, Herb. Let it go, Herb. Let it go, Herb. Nice work, Herb. Adderley won five titles with Green Bay, but finished his career with the Cowboys. We're champions, number one. Dallas Cowboys. Where he played in two more Super Bowls, winning one. He played in four of the first six Super Bowls. Herb Adderley, if you ask me, is kind of the Bill Russell of the NFL. This guy won six championships. Our number seven Packer got bumped up on our list for staying true to the green and gold. He's legendary for basically saying he doesn't wear his Cowboys ring. When he retired, he was very clear that he's a Packer and doesn't want to be remembered as a Cowboy. I love this. For all of us cowboy haters all across America, we would do the same thing. Oh, I want a ring with the cowboys. Stick that in the basement, Ma. The number six Green Bay Packer of all time. All 40. Paul Horning was one of the most versatile football players that ever played pro football. That's the way I would like to be remembered. He could do everything. He could run the football. Beautiful run by Paul Horning. He could kick. He could throw the football because he'd been a college quarterback in Notre Dame. Paul Horning has been the man carrying the mail. Horning scored 176 points in 12 games in 1960. He averaged almost 15 points a game. He's got the five cuts into the end zone for the touchdown. Horning's scoring record stood for 46 years until LaDainian Tomlinson eclipsed the mark in a 16-game season in 2006. Charger fans are witnesses to history! He just did everything. You don't see a ball player like that today. You don't see one that has the opportunity to even try all those things. The Golden Boy was the Packers' first overall pick in 1957. But it took two years and a new head coach to discover his value. It wasn't that anybody doubted his skills. They were wondering, what is he going to do in the pros? So along came Vince Lombardi, who said, you're my back. Lombardi created Frank Gifford in New York by sort of a halfback who could catch, run, and throw. And he said, there's my Gifford. He saw it on film before they ever played a game. I am truly amazed by the performance of Paul Horning. He was Lombardi's pet. Horning was Lombardi's favorite player. But he had all these extracurricular things going on, and Lombardi used to, you know, bark and yell at him a little bit, but uh, I think uh, Vince really loved him. I'll bet Paul Horning was a big reason why a lot of women started to like the National Football League. <laughs> Paul was an impact player on the Green Bay Packers. He also was an impact player on half the females in the United States. He certainly had very strong leadership qualities off the football field. Come on, Rick. quit laughing, man. Quit laughing. The broads that he brought in. If you're bad on the field and you'd be bad off the field with the chicks. But Coach Lombardi, in his heart of hearts, wished that he could be like that. So why isn't Hornig higher on our list? You can bet 
His year-long suspension in 1963 for gambling on football had something to do with it. He was the first one to admit that he, he knew he shouldn't be doing it, and he took it like a man, took the one-year suspension, and, and came back and uh, played far beyond that. I have a lot of problems to face this year, a lot of mental problems which will arise, and it is a big problem, I think, the number one problem which we will have to uh, just bear up under. Our number six Packer was a two-time league MVP, but might not have been the best runner in that backfield. Horning was definitely a better player than Taylor off the field. Whether it was a better player than Taylor on the field, I absolutely don't think so. His numbers do not even compare. Jim Taylor ran for 83 touchdowns. Paul Horning ran for 50. Horning running beautifully. Paul Horning, to me, might have been one of the more overrated players in the NFL, and I think that even might be a little high on that list. No, give me a break, man. Taylor is a thousand-yard rusher because Horning, Horning was that lead block. And the teamwork of he and Taylor that made it all possible. Golden Boy gets what Golden Boy wants, and that's higher on this list than Jim Taylor, although Jim Taylor is absolutely upset about that. Totally ticked off. Coming up, who will be our highest defensive player? He epitomized Green Bay Packer football. We're talking about the best defensive tackle, defensive end ever. All players succeed on the blackboard, but men make them work. Before we continue our list, let's take a look at which men earned a spot so far. The Watch the hell! Number 10. Jim Taylor powers his way onto our list. He wouldn't back down from any contact at all. The guy was a tough physical player. Number nine, Jerry Kramer makes the block around the world. It's probably the most famous tackle to tackle block in the history of pro football. Number eight, Dave Lofton is the good news on a bad team. Fires downfield, complete to Lofton. He was the shining light in a, in a poor era. Number seven, the mayor of Titletown. Herb Adderley is kind of the Bill Russell of the NFL. This guy won six championships. Number six, Paul Horning does it all. He could run the football, he could throw the football, he could do everything. And now, the number five Green Bay Packer of all time, Ray Nitschke. My name is Ray Nitschke. I'm the middle linebacker for the Green Bay Packers. If you think of Green Bay Packers, I would bet that most people, one of the first names that comes to mind is Ray Nitschke. But if there is a player other teams love to hate, it's Ray Nitschke, number 66, Green Bay's all-pro middle linebacker. He epitomized Green Bay Packer football. The Barney era, baby! <laughs> the pictures of him are legendary with his teeth missing, and he's just the, the epitome of 60s era tough guy football. His threatening appearance and nasty temperament once caused Los Angeles columnist Jim Murray to write, the Green Bay Packers came here by jet, but Ray Nitschke just rode his broomstick. Came out of Chicago, he was a tough guy from a tough neighborhood, he got in trouble off the field. My parents died when I was very young and I think I took it out on the neighborhood kids and I was always fighting and getting in the entanglements with the other kids were in the neighborhood. He would snarl at you if you got too close. Come on, Magoo! He wasn't just a, a crazy guy. He was very agile, had a great nose for the ball, and once he got to you, he just leveled you. Ray Nitschke's menacing stare was intimidating. He's number five on our list because he became the face of Lombardi's defense. They wound up building the defense around him. In 15 seasons in Green Bay, Nitschke was a seven-time All-Pro. And at number five, he's the highest Lombardi defender on our list. Ray Nitschke, the fine linebacker for the Packers. No better player overall. He epitomizes the Packers. I would argue he should be number one. And what a privilege it was to go on the athletic field and play middle linebacker for the Green Bay Packers. You know, some people think Ray Nitschke was overrated. And they think because of the persona and the teeth and everything else and the nastiness that he wasn't as good as he was. But I look at him and I saw a guy for that era. He hit people in the hole as hard as anybody. If I had to start an all-time team, my middle linebacker would probably be Ray Nitschke ahead of Dick Buckus or Sam Huff or anybody like that. Look, Nitschke is great. Nitschke deserves on this list, but Nitschke shouldn't be higher than five. Come on, 
I'm just not going to be the guy to tell him that. Sorry. You go tell Ray he's not higher on the list. The number four Green Bay Packer of all time, Reggie White. I don't think I've ever seen a defensive lineman like Reggie White. Look at Reggie. Number 92, Reggie White has been relentless. Physically, he was the most talented big guy I've ever seen in my life. He was consistently the guy that brought the Packers back to prominence again. The Vince Lombardi Trophy is coming home. We're talking about the best defensive tackle, defensive end, whatever you want to call him, ever. He just throws Max Lane to the side. He was at anchor left end. He was the pass rusher that made everybody else better. Linebackers are better. Defensive backs are better. Other defensive linemen are better because of his presence. We want a division. No. Yeah. No. Good job. Reggie White made it cool to play in Green Bay. When NFL titles were flowing freely during the 60s, Green Bay became known as Title Town. But when the championships dried up in the 70s and 80s, Title Town became an NFL purgatory. Nobody wanted to go to Green Bay and freeze. Hands are frozen. Your hands are frozen? Are your feet frozen? Yeah. Go freeze to death. Packers' fortunes would be saved forever thanks to an inspired decision by the Minister of Defense. I'm bringing the sack to the pack. The highest profile free agent in the first free agent class chose Green Bay, Wisconsin. That's a pretty big deal. Reggie said God told him to go to Green Bay. God left a voicemail, so that's pretty important. On a whim, I just phoned him up and said, uh, Reggie, this is God. I want you to go to Green Bay. And then I hung up the phone. Oh, that was Holmgren faking God? Still, pretty important. You can trace the rise of the Green Bay Packers into Super Bowl champions and perennial playoff teams to the signing of free agent signing of Reggie White. Despite playing only six seasons in Green Bay, Reggie White may have made the biggest impact of any player on our list. There's a chant of Reggie throughout Lambeau Field. Gave them real leadership. We need everybody today. Every single person on this team. And gave them a defensive force that they hadn't had in many, many years. Reggie White's going to take over this game right now. Our number four Packer led the team to six playoff appearances, two Super Bowls, and a world championship. World champion, Green Bay Packers. Was he a Packer or was he an Eagle? And I think, I don't know if people remember him as a Packer as much as they maybe remember him as a great player with the Eagles. But I think White deserves to be high on the list of top ten Packers. He helped bring a Super Bowl here. Absolutely Reggie White deserves to be on this list. And again, if he was alive today, I wasn't going to be the one to tell him that he wasn't higher. Still to come, what quarterback will be revealed on our list? Hey, that's all you got! I don't think you can underestimate how great a player he was. Being a successful quarterback in Green Bay means more than just looking the part. Quarterback stance should be as comfortable as possible with the feet spread approximately the width of the shoulders. Len Dickey held the position for nine years, passing for 133 touchdowns, but only made the playoffs once. He sort of lost in, in football history, had some really good years in the NFL, would never be considered a great quarterback. Don Mikowski led the NFL with over 4,300 passing yards in 1989. Magic! But lost his job three years later. If you get hurt and Lou Gehrig or Brett Favre replaces you, you better look for a new team. Aaron Rodgers was named the MVP of Super Bowl 45 and just barely missed making our list. We need some time here, guys. A little breathing room here. We're like 14 seconds after he just won the Super Bowl. But no quarterback won more championships in Green Bay than our number three Packer. The number three Green Bay Packer of all time, Art Starr. The 60s will be described as a decade in which the Packers were the number one team and Bart Starr was proudly the number one Packer.
A lot of people pick Bart Starr apart. They say, look at all the talent around them. But Bart Starr knew exactly what Lombardi wanted. Every player must go all out on every play. He knew how to call the game. He knew how to be a leader. It was, what does the coach need me to do? What's the precision this offense is going to operate under? And how are we going to win games? That's the object of football. It's win the game. The difference this afternoon was the passing of Bart Starr. I'm Bart Starr. I was a 17th round draft choice of the Green Bay Packers. My first year to Bart Starr was... Uh an unknown quantity. To me, he was like methane gas. Colorless, odorless, tasteless, virtually invisible. Star was not worth knowing before Lombardi got there. He had won just three games and 20 starts. He'd had twice as many interceptions as touchdowns. Took Lombardi a couple months to figure out, this guy, I can put him on the field, he's going to run my offense perfectly. Be circle, be right open to the wing, see? It was a perfect combination of coach and quarterback. Defensively, they don't seem to be coming off the ball. Maybe 53 and 52, see? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Bart Starr, statistically, wasn't, you know, he wasn't the greatest quarterback of all time. He was good. So why isn't our number three Packer higher on the list? Even though he led the NFL in passing three times, something Brett Favre failed to do once, Starr never threw for more than 2,500 yards or 20 touchdowns in a single season. You may not put him in the same category as some of the dynamic players we've seen because he didn't wow you with those big statistics. Star hitting perfectly with a quick toss. When he was quarterback, the job was different. The job wasn't to throw the ball 40 times a game. It wasn't to, to put up these numbers. That's not how you did it. Certainly not how you did it under Lombardi. Do you know how many one-yard touchdown passes Bart Starr threw in his career? One. Do you know how many two-yard touchdown passes Bart Starr threw in his career? One. By contrast, Peyton Manning has thrown 37 one- or two-yard touchdown passes. How does that happen? That's not how the Packers' offense worked. They didn't want to throw the ball at the goal line. They didn't have to throw the ball at the goal line. There are other quarterbacks, even in that era, who just had these dazzling numbers and everything, but, I mean, they didn't win like he did. Our number three Packer earned his spot on the list by winning five NFL championships and MVP honors in the first two Super Bowls. He was just terrific in the postseason. 15 touchdowns, only three interceptions. He completed 61% of his passes. He only lost one playoff game in his career. Never lost the playoff game at home. All he did was win championships. What we keep forgetting is he called his own plays. 41 quick on three. Break. He ran that system. Even though Lombardi you know, put it out there, Bart ran the game. While Jerry Kramer delivered the most famous block in the ice bowl, it was Star's guts that made it all happen. The NFL championship's at stake. This guy just runs his own thing. 16 seconds remaining, 17 to 14. I said, Coach, I can shuffle and lunge my way into the end zone. All he said in a crisis time like that was, then run it, and let's get the hell out of here. Takes the snap. on those things, uh, you look like an idiot, but uh, we were lucky enough on that one, they were top five. Bart Starr, to me, the best big game quarterback of all time, and, and to me, the definitive Packer. Coming up, we address the elephant in the room. Brett Favre. Brett Favre. Brett Favre. Is Favre number one or number two on our list? Finding playmakers throughout Packers history isn't difficult. Making our list as a wide receiver is... Sterling, we still love you, buddy! Sterling Sharp set an NFL record with 107 receptions in 1992. The Sharp touchdown! And then again with 112 the following season. Sterling Sharp has to be on the list. You look at the window of Sterling Sharp, what he did for five or six years, I don't know if that would be touched. Antonio Freeman delivered in the clutch with 231 receiving yards and three touchdowns and two Super Bowl appearances. Down the sideline, the I was a part of a Super Bowl championship team, so I think that budges me up a couple of knots. Donald Driver finally won his ring in 2010, but still couldn't crack our list. The guy's been fantastic, and he's going to be, or he is, the greatest Packer receiver ever. While these three couldn't grab a spot on our list, they caught plenty of passes from our number two Packer. 
the number two Green Bay Packer of all time, Brett Favre. Two. If Brett Favre is number two, who is number one? Brett Favre could be number one. He had almost two decades of pretty much dominance in Green Bay and kept that small market afloat. Brett Favre just throws a perfect ball. Everyone knew Brett Favre. Everyone knew Green Bay, what Green Bay was because of Brett Favre. You gotta love it. Can you wait pass, Roy? Brett Favre to modern era football is the Green Bay Packers. Brett Favre should be number one. No, 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 no. Look, there's an entire roster of players that won five championships under Vince Lombardi. Brett Favre was not as good a quarterback as Bart Starr. Just period, end of sentence. That is an unbelievable turn of events. Bart Starr is, was, and will remain the iconic Packers quarterback. They had spent 20 years after Bart Starr trying to find a quarterback. Favre gave them hope. If you look at his entire body of work, his numbers, how he had to carry those teams, how his teams weren't nearly as talented, I think you have to put Favre ahead of Star. In 1992, an injury to Don Mikowski gave Favre the starting job, a position he held for 253 straight games in Green Bay. Lou Gehrig is, is a remarkable streak. I think Brett Favre is more remarkable because Lou Gehrig didn't get hit. Wow, did he take a hit? Hey, that's all you got! It's the most amazing streak in sports. When you look at the hits he endured, Brett Favre, game in and game out, it's astounding. You know, we're coming after your ass. Well, everybody does. Not only did you do it from a health standpoint, but you did it from a production standpoint. That's the amazing part of it to me. Our number two Packer was a three-time MVP and holds the NFL record for career wins, passing touchdowns, and yards. Favre was astounding. His records are just unbelievable. I don't know if he had like a Steve Austin, you know, bionic compartment in his arm or what, what was going on with him. And a great Brett Favre throw. Brett Favre was a gunslinger. He wasn't a real deep thinker. If he liked it, he threw it. Touchdown! No more rocket balls, please. When I was playing touch football growing up, there'd be ten guys wide open. But I'd always throw the guy that was covered. Because that was the hard one to do. We're watching for those did you see that moments. And he gave you so many of those, whether he's throwing the ball backwards or shot putting it. Favre is the creative quarterback. Or singing it in a place that you say, who else gets it there? That was one magnificent throw. I got to see this. This bar about him. Brett Favre. The way he handled himself, people could relate with Brett Favre. You know the capital of Thailand? Thank God. I like him with his Wrangler jeans and his baseball hat and his truck and all that. I like him. He looks like a down-to-earth guy. Favre won the Packers their first Super Bowl in three decades, but failed to crack our top spot for one reason. He's Green Bay's Benedict Arnold. I think we all know why I'm here. Is he going to retire? It's over. Is he going to unretire? I've always wanted to be a Packer. I think I always will be a Packer. Is he going to retire? Unretire. To walk across the state border and then go play for the Vikings is the ultimate act of treason. We need to remember this when talking about his legacy. Yes! If Brett Favre had retired when he could have, when he left Green Bay, I don't think there's any doubt he'd be considered the greatest Packer in the history of the franchise. Are we done? Are we done? We're not done. Coming up, our number one greatest Packer. I think this is one that Vince Lombardi would be proud of. Jeez, I'm a nervous wreck. Before we reveal who is the king of Titletown, let's take one more look at the Packers' royal court. Number 10, Lombardi's workhorse, Jim Taylor. And he piled, drives his way in for the Packer touchdown. He was the guy carrying the load. Number 9, Jerry Kramer pulls his way onto our list. Kramer was a good enough athlete that he could get out there and he could make that block. All right. James Lofton is the Renaissance man of the Dark Ages. Lofton with a catch. James Lofton was a dominant receiver. Number seven, Herb Adderley stays true to the green and gold. He's legendary for basically saying he doesn't wear his cowboy's ring. Number six, a golden donor becomes a golden boy. Catch into the end zone for the touchdown. Horning was Lombardi's favorite player. Number five, Ray 
Dwayne Hinchy gnashes and gnashes everyone in his path. Once he got you, he just leveled you. Number four. We need everybody to get But she White was the title back in the title time. World champion. The best defensive end, whatever you want to call him, ever. Number three. Green Bay's North Star. All he did was win championships. Number two. Sorry, Brett. You aren't the leader of the pack. If Brett Favre is number two, who is number one? And I, the number one Green Bay Packer of all time, Don Hudson. Interesting to pick Don Hudson as the number one Green Bay Packer of all time. It's going to be hard for some people to accept, uh, but it's true. Here's Green Bay Packer great Don Hudson taking an Arnie Herber pass for a long game. I got a hard time putting anybody that caught passes in the 1930s number one of any list that includes current guys. He was a great Packer, a great football player, and I'll tell you, that's a lot of guts to pick Don Hudson number one. Here's Don Hudson, once the pride of Alabama, one of the fastest men in pro football. I recognized the name, I didn't know who he was. But when I saw footage, I said, oh, that's Don Hudson. In the 30s and 40s, Don Hudson was the NFL. His dominance was so complete, he has to be at the top of our list. Don Hudson's numbers for his time as a receiver were so much better than everybody else, it's mind-boggling. Don Hudson, 1942. 1942, 72 catches. 1,400 yards, 17 touchdowns. Don Hudson had as much production that year as the next three receivers combined. Love Don Hudson, a lot of respect, but he's playing where there's like guys that are covering him, they're working at a factory, then coming, putting on a helmet and, and trying to defend Don Hudson. As impressive as he was on offense, our number one Packer was equally effective on defense. He led the league with six interceptions in 1940. And oh, by the way, he was also the team's best kicker. Yes, sir. Don Hudson is considered by most the first modern receiver, though he wasn't playing in what you would call the modern era. Don Hudson's legacy has stood the test of time. Our top packer modernized the role of the receiver. He was the first guy that actually ran what looked like modern day pass patterns. He was the first guy that kind of ran under the ball. Didn't just catch it with his feet planted and then try and run like a fullback. Hudson stretched the field and had the speed and the grace that no one else had at that time. Don's blazing speed made him hard to cover. As the first great receiver in pro football, I would have a hard time arguing with him as the top packer of all time. Oftentimes the guys who played in the 40s and the 50s get overlooked because the tape isn't as good. People say it was a slower game when, you know, I'm not sure you can buy into that. It'd be interesting to see how fast he really is nowadays. I mean, you know, back then it was the 100 yard dash. Now, I don't think anybody was ever timed in the 40. With his opponents now far behind, Hudson puts on more speed and reaches out for a 50 yard pass. Yow! 50 yards if it's an inch. He set records that lasted an awfully long time. His touchdown record, 99 touchdowns, lasted until Steve Largen broke it. And that long pursuit of Don Hudson's career touchdown reception was over. When we talk about Don Hudson being number one, I personally think Don Hudson may have been one of the greatest, if not the greatest, player ever to play in the National Football League because he dominated his position so much and for so long. Now that our list of Green Bay's finest is complete, is it another title for Title Town or just a cheesy choke job? It's a puzzle for me. I did say that all the Lombardi Packers should be one through nine, and then James Lofton. Now I have to rethink that stance. Why do we always take ten? There's eleven on offense. There's eleven on defense. Why don't we make it the top eleven? We got eleven. I say that the Packer fans and the people that own stock in the Packers, I think they should be on that list of top tens. No. In addition to Marty Smith. <laughs> What? Rugged fullback, Barty Smith. Yeah, why not? Woo! We kick Brett Favre off. They can't do that. I know he's got his own list. He's on every other list. Today, Today on Top, top 10. 10. All far, all the time. Let's kick Brett Favre off and put both Lofton and Sharp on this list. Guess who? Sterling Sharp. Barty Smith. Look it up on the internet. You'll find it.